All right, so we'll get started. Actually, I think we have enough team members here, so we'll just cancel the talk and do our team meeting. If you guys, all right. Good afternoon, Seattle. How you doing? No, no, no. Good afternoon, Seattle. How you guys doing? All right, that's more like it. All right. So my name is Jack. This is my teammate, Kashan. Uh, we're both PMs in Microsoft's Linux Platforms Group. We provide Linux platforms both to our internal teams and services, as well as our Azure customers. And we're going to talk to you today a little bit about uh, lessons and challenges that we've uh, that we encounter and lessons that we've learned from running Linux at hyperscale at Microsoft. So a little bit about myself first. Uh, like I mentioned, I'm a PM in LPG. Um, I've been doing open source since 1994. Honestly, don't even know how that happened, but um, uh, was at Red Hat for a very long time, was on the founding Fedora team, um, and was at Twilio for uh, a while when Twilio started up. So I uh, was very, very, very fortunate to have some great experiences. Um, I'm also very active in the Red Hat Fedora CentOS community. If any of you are in those rooms or in that community, you've seen me around. And uh, apparently, I like pain, which you'll find out about in a little bit. And I'll uh, let Kashan introduce himself. Hi, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kashan. Um, last name is Kashan. I know the last name, Kashan. I'm working as a PM in Linux Systems Group as well, and currently responsible for Linux quality. Uh, for Linux platform, as well as building the new features, uh, supporting the guest OS. On the quality side of it, me and my team uh, sitting across the, around the globe uh, supports uh, Linux images validation, Linux kernel signs offs, and Linux VMs uh, sign offs as well. So we are pretty excited to be here and going to reveal a lot of details about it today. Awesome. Yeah, and we're going to be talking about a lot of stuff publicly for the first time, which is very exciting too. So I want to start off, um, it would not be a Linux conference without asking, what is your distro? So I'll leave this up for a few seconds and I'll let everyone scan it and then we'll have some fun with this. <laughs> you can do it too, Jack. <laughs> All right, so everyone good with that? Awesome, all right, so in the beginning there was dog. Um, this is a nice piece of tech trivia actually. So Azure started out as Windows Azure in 2008. Uh, the code name was uh, Project Red Dog. Um, it really grew out of Microsoft's need to support customers that wanted to run like a .NET pass. Um, and uh, as things evolved, and customers really wanted to run uh, more LAMP stack stuff. So Microsoft uh, shifted a little bit and started offering like second generation Azure services, which were focused around traditional LAMP stacks. So Linux, uh, uh, Apache, uh, MySQL, PHP. Um, it's actually interesting because uh, from 2008 to 2014, there were zero VMs running Linux in Azure. And so let's take a look at how far we've come since then. So uh, I guess, you know, at a certain point, Pig started to fly. Uh, Microsoft started contributing to the Linux kernel. At one time, uh, we were in the top five contributors to the kernel. Uh, between 2012 and 2014 is when the first two distributions were introduced. So that was CentOS and Ubuntu. Um, and Satya must have got his hands on some of that because he decided to say Microsoft loves Linux. And here we are today, um, a few more milestones along the way, uh, something that we work on. Uh, and if you see here, oh, where's my thing? So these uh, Azure tuned kernels, uh, that's something that Kashan and myself actually work on with the distributions. Uh, we work really closely hand in hand with them to make sure that um, the whole of the Azure platform is supported whether that be features, whether that be functionality. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, more about that uh, a little bit later on. Um, and then GitHub said that Microsoft was a top open source contributor. So of course we had to acquire them because they said something nice about us. And then uh, in 2023, 
uh, we decided that, you know, we had matured enough that we decided to do what every geek must do. And we decided to release our own version of Linux. So that got a, a lot of people talking. Um, it's really a great, great effort, great initiative. Uh, if anyone's interested, this is a to totally different topic. But my teammate Suranva's here who can answer some questions on that if you want. Um, and then we come to where we are today. So uh, as of today, there are hundreds of Azure services running on Linux. Um, not, not Azure Linux, Linux in general. I want to make sure that that's clear to everyone. They're all different flavors of Linux running all over the place. Um, some of the most popular services actually, AKS, uh, a lot of the open AI stuff, a lot of the infrastructure that powers you know, everything else is running on Linux, uh, HD Insight, uh, a lot of the database services. So we've come to a point where we went from zero to 100 real quick. Um, and obviously, like Microsoft, uh, open source is an integral part of what we do at Microsoft. So I think these are not the updated slides, by the way. Um, but these are the numbers are slightly higher than this. But we consume over 60,000 open source components to make all this possible. Uh, we have 30,000 employees with GitHub presence, um, and we have, uh, it's closer to 8,000 GitHub repositories from within Microsoft. So just a lot uh, being done to be part of the open source ecosystem, and not only do we utilize, but we also contribute a lot. So um, we're very active in a broad range of projects. I mean, this is like only skimming the surface here, but if you look at things like uh, you know, they contribute a lot to the kernel. We spoke about Azure Linux. The maintainer of System D works at Microsoft now. We recently released Garnet as a Redis replacement uh, under an open source license. Uh, all of our confidential computing efforts that we're working on, um, that's all being done, you know, within the upstream Linux kernel and in other upstream communities. Uh, cloud native, I mean, there's just tons of stuff all over here. You know, whether it's Kubernetes, uh, uh, Helm, Cilium, uh, Inspector Gadget, which uh, the Azure Core team works on, um, lots and lots of AI stuff. I mean, if we had to fit the AI stuff on here, I don't, we would need like 10 slides to fit it all on here. Um, so again, like everyone's favorite VS Code, just so much stuff that Microsoft contributes to open source. And I think this, like people don't realize this, but this is so cool. Because if you would have asked me 20 years ago, you know, like, where's your dream place to work? Or where would you be working 20 years from now? My, I worked at Red Hat. Like, Microsoft was enemy number one, enemy of the state. Like, do not engage at all costs. And I'm standing here on a stage today talking about how much Microsoft contributes to open source. Um, and it's really, really amazing. It really says a lot about, you know, just the culture of the company and, and how the company thinks about serving its customers and really serving our mission, which is to empower every human all across the globe, every day, at all times, whatever that whole long sentence is. They probably made us memorize it, but I forgot it at this point. <laughs> um, and this is like the big news, right? So Linux is the number one operating system in Azure today. Like, we started out as a Windows platform, and Linux is the number one OS being run in Azure today. 60% um, of cores are running uh, Linux and also 60% of the marketplace images are Linux based offerings, which is amazing. Now, a lot of effort goes into this uh, operationally. There are many challenges, which we're going to talk about in a second. And uh, we work closely with really like every distro to make sure that, you know, everything runs well for ourselves, for our customers, for everyone around the world. Uh, so, talking about Linux distros, uh, we have this concept of endorsed distros. Um, Endorsement does not mean a recommendation. Endorsement has a few criteria that we're going to talk about, but these are basically the seven endorsed distros. So what does being endorsed actually mean? Um, the first thing is, it's actually the third thing on here, but strong market demand, right? So we want to, if, if a distro is going to be endorsed, we want to make sure that they're actually people that want to use the distribution because we, we invest significant efforts into making sure it runs well. Um, we have a contractual relationship with the distribution vendor. Um, sometimes this is not the upstream publisher, like in the case of CentOS. We have a different uh, uh, Perforce uh, by OpenLogic are actually the ones that publish that image, and we have a great relationship with them. 
Um, and then we also have uh, engineering collaboration forum. Uh, this means that we periodically sync up with them, whether this is in like weekly, monthly, whatever cadence meetings we have, and then deeper engagements, which we call distro days, which we run, which basically, you know, we get everyone in a room for a day or two and just dive deep on all the different things we have going on, making sure that we're, we know what our milestones are, making sure we know what our goals are and get, getting, formulating plans to get there. And also the last piece of this is uh, in Azure Mirror infrastructure. So we want to make sure that the user experience is second to none. And we want to make sure that when you want a package or an update, it's right there sitting, you know, within the same network as, uh, as your compute. So we have, uh, that's one of the requirements for endorsement. So this is basically our guest, Linux guest OS development lifecycle. And operationally, I want to talk about, um, basically three areas here, right? So the first one is the actual like development and new features, new releases, new images that come out. The second thing that I want to talk, talk about is the, uh, the distro mirrors and the updates. Um, and there's some numbers on there, which we'll get into. Um, like I said, there are 20,000 uh, Linux based images in the marketplace. And then finally, like the operationally VMs that are running, how do we deal with those? and what the challenges there are. So the first challenge is new images and features. So we actually have about 1,000 images a month um, from these endorsed distro partners that cycle through our process. Um, that seems like a very high number, you may say. Yes, it is a high number because this also includes different variants, right? So we have like a regular SUSE image, we have an HPC SUSE image, we have a uh, uh, an Ubuntu image, we have special offers that Canonical offers to like private customers and things like that. So in totality, it's close to a thousand images a month. There's a large quality initiative around this, which Kashan is gonna talk about in a few minutes. But uh, the main challenge here for us is really timing. Um, every distro has their own release cycle. We, it's like a three-way, if I go back to the previous slide, so it's really like a three-way dance between us and the upstream um, and the community, right? So we need to make sure that we plan out what features and, and you know, what fixes or what product stuff we have landing in a given period. And then we need to go back and basically work back with all these distributions to make sure that things land in the upstream Linux kernel, for example, um, in a timely fashion so that when they decide that they're going to pull in the latest set of patches, it's ready and they can pull that in and there are no issues there. So like you know, the kernel releases like about every two and a half months or every three months more or less. Um, and there's a whole dance that goes on coordinating with these. The most fun one I would like to point out is Oracle, obviously, um, because Oracle Unbreakable Enterprise Kernel has no defined release cycle. It's just whenever they decide they want to release it. So we'll get an email from them saying there's a release coming and then we're panicking for the next three days trying to line up all the product managers like requirements for what needs to be done to land in this kernel. So it's a lot of fun. Um, and then we have uh, 125 other marketplace publishers, which also mostly they have very customized images, but for the most part, they do use these endorsed distros as a base. So the next thing I want to talk about is uh, uh, the package updates. Um, once a machine, once an image is in there and people get it up and running, they need to install updates. And then one of the things that we've run into and we've seen is the lazy sysadmin, right? People like install Ubuntu, they turn on unattended updates, and they just let it rip. And then at three o'clock in the morning, Jack gets a phone call. Hey, Azure Kubernetes service is down. Do you have any idea why? Um, a lot of fun. Uh, we do significant uh, testing on packages that land like in proposed, uh, Ubuntu proposed and other distros as well. Stuff that they put out either in beta or that they put out you know, as a preview to make sure that that happens. We also actually have an effort uh, working with each distribution individually to make sure that they're also executing on package testing um, in Azure. So that basically, you know, we're and we're running a lot of basic things. Like we want to make sure like post an update that the NIC doesn't go down or that the IP address doesn't vanish for some reason and that 
they can a customer can SSH in uh, to their machine. Um, one thing that we worked on with Canonical was uh, we worked with them to enable app repository snapshots. So this is actually something that's available to the open source community at large, not just Microsoft. But um, if you want to pick a package from a known good point um, anywhere in an app repository on Ubuntu and now folding into Debian, uh, you can actually go in and give it on the like app command line uh, time and date for the snapshot and it'll always pull from that place in time. So it's like really, really, really like awesome innovative stuff to make sure that the stability is there and that everything uh, uh, operationally will continue working. We also maintain significant efforts on a Red Hat update infrastructure. There's a lot of work that we do there that honestly, this is probably a talk for the Red Hat Summit, but I just wanted to mention it here because uh, there's a lot going on there. And then um, all of this folds into something which we are trying to make a thing, which is safe deployment practices via the Azure guest patching service. So things like what we did with Ubuntu on this apt, like repository snapshot thing, we're able to take the output of that and roll it into a product where a customer can sign up and basically have secure deployment of their updates. So if you're running a global fleet, you can come back and say, I want to test this region at this time. And then once you see that that actually works, roll out packages from that version of the repository um, all throughout the rest of your fleet, like basically on a cadence so that you're not at risk of like everything hitting at one time and then just taking out your whole fleet. Um, another challenge, every distro, of course, likes to have their own method of communication. Um, and of course, none of them offer an API. So as you can imagine, uh, you know, uh, Ubuntu uses like Launchpad and Salesforce. Red Hat uses Jira, SUSE uses Bugzilla, Debian mailing list. Sometimes they don't even pay attention when you send them stuff. Um, you know, so it's, there's a lot of challenges and a lot of manpower and a lot of human power, I should say, and just a lot of work that goes into managing these operational challenges and making sure that this is a smooth process. Um, the last thing that I wanted to talk about was uh, once distros are actually running on a VM. One thing that we've needed to manage lately between like the Ubuntu 1804 end of life and the CentOS end of life is what do you do when a distro dies, right? Um, it's a big security issue for many users. It's something that many users may not even be aware of because they set up their VM, you know, years ago and it's just there humming along and they're not even really paying attention to it. So we basically coalesced around like four pillars. Um, there's actually like some context missing here, but this is basically like the hundreds of thousands of users. And this is the time between April last year and April this year. So you see, we're still not even down to zero on Ubuntu 18.04. There's a reason for that because some people still need to run it for whatever purpose, but um, these four pillars. So the first one is the customer pillar where there's a lot of notification involved, uh, migration guidance, telling them and assisting them and guiding them where to go next. Um, and also continuity, which is I still need to run this end of life distro. Maybe I'm building a product or something and I can't ship out anything else to my customers. I can't give them an updated image. So I need to keep running this. Um, and that's where we did cool things. Like we worked with Ubuntu to enable uh, Ubuntu server to pro upgrades from within Azure portal and within the CLI. So if you have uh, an Ubuntu server running and for some reason it's going end of life, you can just go in and click and say, I want to run this. There's a whole bunch of stuff that happens in the back end. Like there's billing considerations that need to be taken into account. There's, we have like in, uh, uh, in our back end, the way things are set up with meters. There's like a whole, a lot of balls that need to be juggled to make sure that this gets executed properly. And we worked with Ubuntu to make sure that, to make sure that that's kind of smooth sailing. Um, the next thing real quick, cause I'm running out of time, uh, documentation. Like I think a lot of people refer, especially us being Microsoft, a lot of people refer to our documentation and people will point out like the smallest of inconsistencies. So we really, we have scripts that go through and find references. Sometimes they're like thousands and thousands of references to these OSs. And we make sure that all of that is expunged properly and that it's updated with whatever guidance needs to be there. Um, the next one is policy. Um, so we still give best effort support for end of life OSs. 
Um, and then uh, we need to prepare our support folks to handle that and also handle like an influx of new requests coming in on a new OS. And the last one here is partners. So I see Stefan from Sousa's in here. So he's one of our good partners. So we work with them too, because when, it, when a distro comes end of life, partners want to make sure, like they have products that they want to sell too, right? And they, we want to make sure that all these things like, you know, Sousa Liberty, ELS, EUS, whatever it is, all that stuff lands properly for Azure customers. So again, a lot of work uh, uh, going into this, but aside from these eight endorsed distros, uh, one of the challenges, the customer's distro choice is always the right distro choice. Um, that's something that KY told me yesterday. Um, you can run whatever Linux you want in Azure. You can bring your own image, you can put it in, you can build your VHD, run it. We will even give you best effort support, right? So it's not like we're telling people you can only use this flavor of Linux. Um, I actually had a link down here. We recently uh, enabled Fedora and CentOS Stream, which is something that I personally wanted to get done and we couldn't do for a long time because Red Hat would not let us up, uh, upload those images because they didn't want uh, those projects being encumbered by the Azure like terms and conditions, right? So community galleries a way for anyone to bring their own image or use an image provided by the publisher that goes straight into the community gallery and the, the publisher gets to define the licensing terms. So we all love open source licensing and you know, what a, what a great fun thing that is. If anyone's following like the Red Hat drama over the last two years, I'm sure you're quite familiar. So that's basically it for my piece. Uh, I'll come back in a little bit, but I wanna let Kashan talk about uh, uh, our quality initiatives. Perfect, perfect Jack. <clears throat> so, um, I would like to give you a preview how we are running the Linux platform with a high quality on Azure, which is essentially the commitment of Microsoft with open source community as well as our customers. So, essentially, if I give you a 10,000 feet view, what this picture is showing is view of Azure fleet. This Azure fleet is currently running millions of VMs uh, on Linux, right? and on 1,000 plus different sizes and SKUs, which is hosted on a complex Azure host uh, and virtualization stack. If you look at the guest side, as Jack mentioned earlier, it's like Marketplace itself is a universe of 20,000 plus images, which is available to customer. Customer can pick and choose whatever the image they want uh, in, without worry, without worrying about anything. They can just pick any image and run their critical workload. Similarly, uh, it's just not just seven endorsed distro, which Jack earlier talked about, which we have some contractual uh, agreements with them, but there are third-party publisher. There are other publisher, 125 plus, and so on, and they keep increasing as well. They do publish their images as well. Uh, and not only this, we have different number of kernels, different releases of kernels, which we maintain at the given point and validate those images on the kernel. And last but not least, we have a guest extension. These are the customized extension available for the guest, which gives the breadth and more uh, kind of um, additional functionality to guests on the customer needed basis. We're gonna talk about a little bit more. So, this was the earlier picture which we saw from uh, the slide earlier, but what we added here is those gates, those red areas where Microsoft injected essentially a lot of validation and gates in order to make sure that these images which is getting in the marketplace, which is getting in the hand of customers, do get validated uh, quite thoroughly. Similarly, we do work with open source community as well where we validate the kernels, we're gonna go a little bit more detail. And then also once we have these images in the marketplace, how we maintain these images quality and how we maintain uh, kind of with the commitment of quality by having these images test tested against the changing of continuously Azure host and other bits. So let's uh, dig down into the guest OS validation, right? Guest OS validation, 
uh, essentially, we do work with our distro partners, uh, which is distinguished distro partners, seven of those, uh, pretty closely. Once there are big releases coming, when there are some new features with customized images coming, not only them, but Microsoft Teams uh, also uh, validate thoroughly and vigorously these images before releasing to the customers. They work closely with them. And then other than that, we also have those ingestion pipeline. As soon as the publisher get the image into the marketplace or kicks the ingestion, we do, we do kick on our all testing uh, pipelines as well to make sure all these images which is getting into it, they pass through the validation. Uh, as I said earlier, post ingestion is just uh, doesn't work, doesn't stop work there. We continuously take those post ingestion images and validate against all the host changes, right? On the kernel side, right, kernel is the side which I was talking earlier, like we work with upstream kernel, we continuously monitor the upstream kernel, the branch especially, the next and the stable branch. So every 12 hours, we get this branch, build the kernels, build the image, get into the image and run through the detail validation and post those results back into the kernel CIDB. So anybody who had some commits already accepted, they can see what the result in Azure environment, and they are available to see you on the kernel CIDB as well. Uh, in term of kernel, we have the distro kernel. We call them as Azure Tune kernel. These kernels are pretty optimized in term of uh, uh, performance, as well as they contain a lot of features and innovation run over the Azure complex hardware. So these ATKs also get signed off by uh, Azure quality team. Every single kernel which you release, it could be every other day, every week, every month, whatever the kernels we comes in, they go through sign off and then our distro partner build the images on top of it. Similarly, package itself is like a universe, right? Now there are 40, 25 to 40,000 plus packages. Uh, we work with the canonical uh, and continuously monitor their pockets, which is uh, their proposed pockets and the main pockets uh, every eight hours or so. And then we run unattended upgrades directly, which Jack ref uh, referenced about the uh, lazy admin. So we go through those updates. Once we have these updates, we run through the BVT, different number of SKUs, different number of VMs, and make sure this update is not causing any regression into the Azure fleet. Once we have this satisfaction, we provide this timestamp to our Azure uh, Linux patching service, and that's the well-known good configuration. That's where they take this timestamp and deploy on the fleet in the uh, proper manner. Uh, gas extension itself, like each team performed their rigorous testing. Each team for had their own testing on, the, on those supported images, but at the meantime, they also have provided list of BVTs. Uh, which we use in the main uh, testing framework. I'm going to talk about that in, the, in, in a slide, uh, next slide or so. And workload, we don't take this lightly. Workload itself is a validation, like whole project in the Microsoft, which is done by different teams and different scales. And then, uh, and then they support and make sure all these workloads are running, regardless of your complex scenario or regardless of uh, you know, VM SKUs. They perform and Azure stands there. Uh, this is a host validation uh, where each release goes through their own detailed testing, right? Azure host has their own army of uh, quality and validation teams. They do perform their own testing, but in terms of a Linux quality and to maintain the Linux quality and the gas quality on those hosts, we consider this is a black box testing. So as soon as any bit is released, any builds a release on the host side, we start running our own validation pipelines uh, containing all the top distro usage currently in place. We take them, we run through the whole validation cycle. If any new features coming in host, we still, regardless, we still go through the whole full validation of this. And then if there is any regression being found either on host side or, or on our uh, Linux side or guest side, we work with endorsed partner very closely. Uh, Linux VM SKU enablement. Uh, Linux quality team also works a lot of uh, these uh, VM SKU enablement. VM SKU getting into the marketplace and joining the Azure fleet, it's pretty common and normal occurrence uh, based on the customer need, based on the 
you know, new technologies and functions. So we have a different type of SKUs as we talked earlier, is thousand plus different sizes and SKUs. We validate and sign off uh, and maintain those. Uh, so these SKUs could be compute or special purpose or you know, GPO or AI oriented uh, SKUs. So they all go through the validation uh, process, which is uh, like from Linux point of view, they go through, we look in the, all the images. As I said earlier, we have like 20,000 plus images. So we look at the usage, we take top 50 images and each image, each SKU goes through those supported images. And then once we pass through those, that's the time when we sign off those SKUs and they are okay to release to the next team and they go through their own testing and hundreds of different scenarios before releasing into the fleet. So we talk about a lot of validation and a lot of, uh, you know, work which quality team is doing and they're sitting across the globe, I mean, around the globe, many different areas, they are running around the cloud testing. We have around 40 to four to five million test cases every month which we been executed on this fleet and these images and different type of uh, art bits. So the testing framework, which is kind of a heart of our core validation and which is basically bring uh, you know life to the, our quality and validation is is a lisa lisa is linux integration service automation we work on this testing framework starting in 2014 when microsoft was heavily involved in linux right so that time we end up putting a lot of uh, test cases which make sure that Linux on Microsoft LIS packages are integrated into image and they are working as they're supposed to be. So we end up starting those test cases, running through the validation, providing those test cases to different teams. These test cases keep growing increased by the time we keep learning, like how these Linux guests are behaving on Azure uh, virtual stack on Hyper-V. And this test cases keep increasing to like 400 plus or so. We made this test cases as open source, so we have some community contribution uh, along with a lot of Microsoft contribution as well. So as V3, in around 2020, we converted these Lisa test cases into Python, so it's more easily be, easily be understandable, and then people can come uh, contribute into that. And now, 2021 and moving forward, we have this one as a standardized uh, testing framework, quality testing framework. And it's open source, a lot of internal and external, our distro partners also use Lisa for their validation as well uh, uh, before getting into, you know, in the uh, images in our hand. Uh, so Lisa currently, uh, you know, support 40 plus areas, right? And then cover performance, functional regression, stress, and community test cases, including, we included LTP, case self-test, uh, KSFS tests as well. So they are also part of the Lisa as well. So we try to make this like one-stop shop where you, once you run Lisa, you're good, you're, and, and your image pass, you're good to go, oh. right? So uh, right now we also kind of, uh, Lisa is supporting different scenario, including the bare metal. We support QMO adopter as well. So you can uh, use Lisa on QMO as well. Uh, and I was talking about the guest extension. We have def dedicated team who owns these extensions. However, they already contributed a lot of test cases in Lisa to make sure all the bits changing in all the images changing on the daily basis or the weekly basis go through the basic athlete test case so that we maintain uh, you know, compatibility of those extensions. So I have, uh, yeah. This one is just a high level view, right? No, nice way to see like you have a DBD cap uh, GPUs, you have like all different type of areas, everything is covered in Lisa. And then we break down into different categories and then there are total number of areas and what are the total number of test cases. Uh, it could be IPREF, it could be SROV, storage related or any other test cases. So we have a, a small a demo here, <clears throat> Which, uh, which essentially we are using Lisa to create two VMs in Azure environment. It's it just Lisa with the one line command. It will create the VMs, it will do some IPREF testing, and then it will show you the result. And then, so I'm gonna play that. Let's see if it works.
it's not working. You cannot hear it. In this demonstration, Lisa is installed and launched on a Windows machine, conducting tests against the newly deployed error VMs. With a single command, a test run starts. Test matrix can be specified in a run book or as command line variables. After selecting the perf TCPI perf SRV test case, error platform is activated. Now, it starts to deploy the two error VMs required for the test case. The VMs have been successfully deployed. Now, the process proceeds to initiate the test nodes, ensuring their accessibility and readiness for testing. The test case logic is initiated. Initially, it checks if iperf3 is pre-installed. If not, it proceeds with the installation. Next, iperf3 testing begins with varying parameter values iteratively on two machines, their server and client roles. Following that, messages containing iperf3 performance test results are generated. These messages include distribution information, host details, network bandwidth data, and other relevant metrics. Upon successful completion of the test case, Lisa initiates the deletion of the test environment. Utilizing Lisa's notifier, such as the dump-perf notifier, these messages are stored in a JSON file. Alternatively, we can employ a database notifier to write performance data directly into a database. Furthermore, you can create your own custom notifier to store data in any location or format of your choice. Perfect. Awesome. So that was just demo. And I have a uh, So I have this last slide. Essentially, in the spirit of empowerment uh, and innovation, what we are planning to do is we, we are launching this self-service uh, in Azure portal. Uh, currently, this API is in preview. What this self-service is, is self-automation portal, right? So it will improve the efficiency and coverage of validation. It will empower our community partners, distros, and image publisher to validate these images themselves on Azure portal. You just go up there, uh, upload your image, and run through the validation, select the test cases, and it will execute all the test cases, and then pass or fail and provide you the status, as well as if it's pass everything, you will have a certificate that your image is validated. So imagine this service will be like, uh, right now right now the api in progress like api in preview we are working on a ux design and bringing into the portal which probably could be six months away but at given time you can still use api which is powered by lisa all these 400 plus test cases uh, essentially you can even integrate through aitl uh, into your cicd pipeline using the rest api so all your tests, whichever you execute, they are secure and safe in such a way that nobody else can see those. It will uh, back by the Azure performance of your security, and they execute based on your, you know, Azure subscription. Uh, if you have Azure subscription, you should be able to use that and run uh, the test cases. So, I wanted to get a view from the audience here. Like, would you be interested? to this tool that available in Azure portal, uh, which will help you to self-validate your tools, uh, self-validate your images, kernels, or any extensions. So if you get a minute or few seconds, you can go up online and just choose yes, no, or maybe. That will give us idea how quickly we need to move this product into the market. Perfect. Thank you. Jack. Awesome. So let's take a look at our results. 
from before. So I think the slot is not in this deck, but so we are, and I apologize, uh, Stefan, uh, Ubuntu is most popular with 45%. Uh, Fedora, Rel, Santos, Family, 35%. Debian, 10%. And Sousa, a res very respectable 10%, I would say. Um, Oracle, 0%, no surprises there. And uh, all the others were zero. But uh, like I said, you can run anything you want. So, I mean, believe me, there's nothing like running Gen 2 in the cloud. Like, you can compile stuff like crazy fast on our high-end SKUs using like all the GPU acceleration stuff. So uh, uh, if you are into Linux, if you're into open source, you wanna come work at a great place on really interesting stuff, our teams are all hiring. Um, check out the link. Uh, you can find me online everywhere. You can find Kashan too, uh, reach out to us, LinkedIn, whatever, Twitter, whatever you wanna call it these days. And uh, you know, let us know. So refer your friends too. And uh, I want to just end off by thanking, first of all, everyone for coming, thanking our partners that also uh, are here and work very closely with us to make this happen. And, uh, you know, I, I think we put together a very compelling case on Microsoft's commitment to open source. And uh, we do a lot of work to make sure that Linux, uh, you know, which is a very big part of that, runs really well. So, I mean, I hope we've earned your trust. And, uh, you know, if you're not running Linux in Azure, you're running it in the wrong place. So please, if you have something you want to run, Bring come see up. us, come to the booth. We're here, we're walking around. They gave us these snazzy, whatever you call it. If you, if you spend enough money, they'll probably give you one too. But uh, come, come see us. And uh, thank you so much for listening to us. Thanks. Thank you. Guys.